Hey, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is the Q2 2020 BISC update. I'll uh, get started right away by sharing my screen. And uh, we did a call like this about four months ago at the end of February. So for a few reasons, it's a good time to do another one. And uh, we'll keep this to an hour, maybe less, and uh, wrap up at the end of the Q&A. But the main points are reviewing what's happened so far this year in Q1 and Q2. We're just at the end of Q2 right now. And uh, talk about what's, what's happening right now, a few announcements, and what going into Q3 might look like. So what have we done so far? I wanted to start by talking about some trading numbers because I don't know about you, but if you're somebody who's in BISC a lot, right, working on it or using it or both, you tend to see this chart a lot, right? You tend to see volume in BTC charting. That's the monthly chart since the inception of the project way back in April of 2016 or the going live of the project, right? And, um, you know, just to map that out, Zooming, zooming in a little bit, right? We probably all know that image. I just heard some artifact. Make sure you're muted uh, if you're not already. Um, but just to plot that out a little more um, visibly, right? This is, you know, this is what things have looked like over the years. And we probably, most of us know what this big spike is all about, right? These are the uh, Monero I think of this as the Monero spike, right? So this is when we had a whole lot of Monero BTC trading on the platform and that and that stopped late last year, right? And we sort of reverted to the mean, if you will. So at a glance, that's like not such an exciting story, right? All of a sudden our, our total BTC volume is back down. Of course, no, never mind overlaid here we haven't overlaid here well what's the bitcoin price right i mean our bitcoin volumes are always going to have a whole lot to do with the value of bitcoin itself but let's just never mind that for a moment we kind of know the narrative right that that monero volume went away so well what does that mean well i think it's just worth looking at it from a different perspective if you haven't already been watching the numbers this way we don't graph them we don't chart them in the in the app and we don't necessarily tweet about them all the time. It's quite instructive to look at the total number of trades happening on a monthly basis here, right? So each gray bar is, you know, you see the total there is 2,000, right? Coming into, you know, March of this year, we had, you know, 34, 3,500. That number at the top is the average number of trades per day in that month. So on, a, on that long trend, you know, this is just a steady uptick with of course some variance month to month, but that's something that's really going in the right direction. So even though we're not seeing these, um, these relatively massive uh, volumes of BTC with you know, just sometimes dozens of two Bitcoin trades between Monero and Bitcoin happening every day, that actually hides the, the story that there's more and more and more usage, more actual trading happening all the time. And you can see this, um, uh, this bears out. These are the <coughs> coin dance um, graphs that people may be familiar with, just looking at a few fiat regions, right? So when we take, you know, altcoins out of the mix entirely and we forget about Monero, you know, this, this story bears out um, in the individual fiat markets as well. So this is the Euro market. Never mind this gap, for some reason, coin dance doesn't have that data. But, um, but again, you can see that kind of just general trend line going in a nice direction, right? More and more Euro volume, generally speaking, month over month. Same thing with the dollar, just happened to have had the best, best month ever there in dollar terms last month. Um, Brazil has been um, quite a standout there. And uh, yeah, and these are just selecting a few of the markets. You can go look at the rest of them, of course. But it just corroborates that, that kind of general good news, actually. This is another another look. This is from uh, monitor.bisc.network, which I'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about later. But these are some of the uh, newer metrics that we've gotten in place that we plan to put in place in Q1 and have rolled it out since. Um, so this is, we call this estimated network size and and uh, 
you know, you see lots of lines here. Never mind the detailed lines, but just kind of look at the top line that the total number of nodes on the network, again, estimated, this data is not perfect, but it's, the methodology here is pretty solid, leads us to believe that it's gonna be something like between two and 300 nodes on the network at any given time. I've got this data blip here recently, we're not quite sure why, but again, even these numbers are still 200. So somewhere in between two and 300, you can think of it as, um, you can think of it as users, but it, it's really measuring nodes, right? So BISC nodes that are online at any given time. And that number has, since we started measuring, been on an uptick, right? And then kind of, you know, steadying out. So that, again, you know, there's not necessarily a causal relationship here between the uptick in the number of trades and the uptick of nodes on the network, but it kind of makes sense that they would be related. So growth continues, right? Even, even if not in... Uh, you know, compared to all-time high uh, total BTC volumes, growth continues. So what did we ship? What did we do over Q1 and Q2? What's new and noteworthy? Um, we'll talk about a number of these in a little bit more detail later. But, um, you know, in general, we didn't ship a lot of big new features uh, in it, so far in this half of this year, right? It's been a lot of under the hood work. It's been a lot of looking after security and privacy issues, some sticky things in there, right? Some, some of it takes a long time. Um, but, you know, we've improved the trade protocol. We've added validations into the trade protocol where necessary. We've been working on um, uh, account signing, sign witness improvements, which ultimately helps not only security, of course, but can also help improve liquidity. We'll talk about that later. Um, privacy, right? We, discovered that we're publishing certain uh, IDs in, you know, in uh, uh, offer data and so on. It's just unnecessary, so we've removed those. Um, we upgraded to Tor v3, right? So any new users, certainly on the network, are, are automatically using Tor v3, uh, you know, onion addresses and so on. So you now see the really long onion URLs for new users. And that we've found has been a general improvement in both startup time connecting to the Tor network and we believe it's responsible for some improved uh, message delivery. So fewer, fewer trades ending up in uh, mediation and arbitration because something failed with the trade protocol, some message didn't get through or what have you. There seems to be an improvement in that that we can relate to this change or we believe is related to this change at least. And uh, in general, we're up to date with, you know, the, uh, changes in Tor, right? So we're not, um, you know, lagging behind. That's always a good thing. Staying, staying up to date there. Uh, reliability, just like I was mentioning a moment ago, making trade protocol uh, messaging more robust, both in the sense of like at the network level, at the Tor protocol level, but also we've given users just the manual ability to click a button and resend uh, certain trade protocol messages like that the payment is received. Right? So sometimes that message would get dropped for whatever reason. And that would end up meaning the trade would go to mediation, right? So that's sort of the only way to resolve it. Um, now, if that seems to be the case, users can just click a button and resend, and very often that solves the problem. Uh, various wallet improvements, talk a bit about more of those later. Uh, we saw what we called the ghost offer problem. Old offers were still showing up that were no longer relevant. So we reject expired data, that's what that's about. And uh, one of the big ones recently was we saw this, you know, big fee spike uh, for, you know, a number of weeks in a row, just, you know, mempools were, uh, relatively speaking, filling up and fees were spiking. And our, our old uh, fee estimation backend, which was uh, earn.com, was uh, failing miserably to give good estimates. Uh, so they were way too high and people were paying way too much to fix that moved away from earn to uh, mempool uh, to the, not to the general notion, but to the project called mempool, mempool API, and uh, are getting much better estimates on that. And we also sort of that the subsequently improved the decentralization of that, that was a single point of failure. Um, they were just talking to earn.com and then we were just talking to one mempool backend. And now we're talking to a number of uh, different mempool backends. So we have that resiliency and 
and decentralization there. And we shipped 11 times uh, since January 1st. So we've had a pretty steady cadence there. Okay, so when we uh, did the Q1 call in February, we laid out a number of goals and I wanna review how, how has it gone there, right? We've already touched on some of these, but just to look at them in terms of uh, the goals that we said that we would be focusing on, how did we do? So number one was to increase liquidity. And uh, oh, by the way, we laid out four back in February and very shortly thereafter, I added a fifth one, right? Improving management because in fact, we had a lot of sort of internal efforts underneath the Dow and it was really worth kind of calling that out as a separate goal because it you know, was resource intensive and something we really wanted to get right. So uh, increasing liquidity, what's the progress been like? Well, one of the, one of the biggest levers that we have potentially to increase liquidity is rolling out an API, right? Making, accessing BISC, trading on BISC programmatic or opening up programmatic access. And that work has been underway. It was stalled for quite some time and it's been actually in progress now for, for some months, just slowly and steadily chipping away one endpoint after another. So from being able to check your balance to ultimately being able to publish uh, uh, an offer, right? Uh, locking and unlocking your wallet and so on. All the things that need to be done in order to accomplish uh, you know, the most basic kind of end-to-end -end trading scenarios so that people can write bots against BISC uh, or ultimately even possibly, uh, you know, write a kind of web front end for BISC or something like that. Um, so that work goes on, and, but, it's, but it's not released yet. We haven't had any sort of initial release. Some people may have noticed that we sent out some tweets and a form yesterday just to begin kind of engaging with the community and making sure that we're building what they want and getting some feedback. So we can expect don't have a date here, but you can expect a kind of MVP, right? A minimum viable product version of the API to ship in the near future. And uh, so stay tuned for that. Like I mentioned, account age witness, account signing improvements uh, underway. Now that's both security, right? Like things like avoiding, you know, bank account fraud and scams, but it also, the more we propagate, uh, you know, account signing and so on, the more people's limits can increase. And of course, that's good for liquidity because people can make, uh, you know, larger trades, right? So it increases the depth of uh, liquidity. And uh, March was a big push for liquidity in the growth team. And uh, th that was certainly successful by some measures, but it's hard to draw real conclusions about it because that was right when all things COVID started to happen and became pretty difficult to keep pushing like we were pushing uh, on you know, market makers and, and, all, and all these efforts when you know, the whole world was um, shutting down and freaking out. So uh, mixed, mixed results, mixed success. Uh, and there are some takeaways there that I'll, I'll get to later that kind of inform us about what we'll do going forward in growth. And uh, like I mentioned, in terms of increasing liquidity, we've seen this steady uptrend uh, in the number of trades, right? And so that's important for liquidity too. If you think about liquidity in these kind of like two major factors, right? You know, there's, there's depth, like, you know, how much Bitcoin can I trade uh, against whatever pair um, on BISC? And then there's just what's the likelihood that I can find a counterparty, right? For any amount, um, how many offers are there? And so on. <clears throat> how many people are involved? So certainly that's been getting better. More offers, more users. Okay, and improving support. This was an area where this was a goal that we focused on a lot, like right out of the gates uh, around the time of that Q1 call and um, made a bunch of progress, right? So we rolled out, uh, you know, a more mature support escalation process. So we kind of have a level one and level two teams now. Level one is now really well staffed. Uh, you know, we've got full coverage, um, you know, more or less around the clock uh, it, it, in a, around the world, right? Uh, where, you know, when people come into Keybase and they go into the support channel and they have a question, uh, operators are standing by, right? Support agents are standing by. And um, so that's, that's been, I think, a win. I think that's something that's working. 
and we have a coverage calendar for that and so on. And the level two support is really just the formalization of escalating things to dev. So, you know, a number of um, uh, uh, BISC dev members, right, are also on the support calendar. They have a daily shifts, you know, every so many days, this dev is on, is on call, that dev is on call. And they're simply there, at, you know, just uh, promising essentially, if something needs to be escalated, I'll be on points, right? And I'll help carry that support case out. And uh, so far, so good. This seems to be a, a situation that's, that's working well. Um, we now have uh, more mediators, right? And better coverage of mediators, uh, better responsiveness among mediators. So when people, when traders do have a trade, you know, uh, it's not working and goes into mediation. Again, now mediators are standing by, right? To help them out quite reliably. Um, we establish a critical bugs board and a process around it, right? So a way that we can see what are the most important, most pernicious, most problematic bugs or other issues, right, that are causing, you know, just basically loss of service or inability to complete use cases and so on. That process is all there. That was delivered. And say that there's work to go to having it really integrated deeply into how we prioritize and, and so on. And we'll get to that. Uh, as in the kind of going forward plan toward the end of this call. Um, we built out the BISC wiki, right? Over these last months, there's been lots of activity in there. And from the perspective of supports, right? It, the BISC wiki does, you know, uh, is, addresses a number of things, right? But uh, from the perspective of support, it acts as a kind of knowledge base, right? So when we have really common things, we want to, um, you know, that we often need to refer users to. Those things are now increasingly in the wiki and just a link away. And the process there is much easier, you know, to add content and, and change content and so on than it, than it was under the docs.bisc network uh, sort of paradigm, which is a much more uh, rigorous kind of change control process. Um, both have their place, both are still up. Uh, and we'll see some exciting new stuff on the docs side uh, in a moment. But the wiki is there, and as you'll see in a moment, we're you know getting ready to announce the really the launch of that. So it's kind of you know sort of ready for prime time in the public to um, to know about it and use it. Uh, okay, and uh, so uh, so other progress, right? One of the things that we said that we would do in Q1 is that we would roll out a kind of detailed support case tracking effort where you, know, you can imagine just like sort of any support organization has a ticketing system, that kind of thing. We plan to use GitHub issues where every you know, support agent would log you know, that, uh, that a, a case came their way, what the problem was, what the resolution was, what any irrelevant bugs were, you know, new bugs that they created because of it, how long it took to close the issue and so on. And we went a good distance toward like designing that and rolling it out but it just got dropped, right? It just didn't have the kind of priority that was necessary to take precedence over lots of other things. And in practice, it seems that we don't really need it. We don't seem to be suffering from, from missing it. So it remains dropped at the moment. Perhaps that's something that we'll pick back up. Maybe another level of uh, you know, uh, uptick in activity and so on will demand it at some point. But for right now, we let it go. And um, arbitration, or so we've, we've called this refund agent cases, but we've returned to calling it arbitration. So there's normal trading, and then if there's a problem, it goes to mediation. And if traders don't agree on the mediator's recommendation, things go to arbitration, right? That's how we call it now. Um, it, this remains a pain point, and I'll, I'll get into that later and, and what we plan to do about it but simply there are just too many of these cases um, coming our way. So we wanna resolve that. Okay, and uh, just to give you a sense, you know, I have these bullet points here and so on, but where is all that information coming from? Uh, it's not just in my head, right? But you know, we're actually tracking this um, in what we call the master projects board. This is part of the overall project management infrastructure and process that's been rolling out over the last months. I'll talk about that explicitly in a moment, but uh, I just wanted to give a quick screenshot here for context. Right here, we're looking at the master projects board and I'm focused in on the goal to improve support 
right? So it's just a label on GitHub, GitHub issues. But you can see that now all the labeled issues like rolling out the BISC wiki, that was a kind of improved support effort. Uh, case tracking project process was aborted. The support team scheduling escalation process was delivered, right? These things that I've been mentioning. So those are actually all tracked on this board as individual projects. And so you'll see another couple of screenshots of this, but that's something you can kind of uh, keep in mind if you're not aware of the infrastructure. As we continue to care for that, that can be a place to go mm -hmm. to really get a high level view of, well, what's going on in the team, right? Um, okay, and so back to the goals, right? So that was improving support, now improving reliability. Talked about most of these already, actually moving toward V3, resending messages, uh, various wallet improvements, you know, kind of small things like how we manage dust, right? But they all add up to making a better experience and having fewer, uh, fewer disappointing experiences for users, right? We had a kind of nasty bug about too long transaction chains, right? Really kind of detailed stuff down at the Bitcoin protocol level, but we've spent time rooting these things out. And like I mentioned, improving fee estimation and in the process, removing a single point of failure or a central point of failure. Okay, so on to the next goal, improving onboarding, right? If you remember from, if you attended the Q1 call, give a kind of sneak preview of a really beautifully designed step-by-step uh, -step onboarding wizard that will take users through the process of doing everything from setting up your seed and so on in a very modern way so that they just end up with a working, ready to go, ready to trade uh, BISC node. We have not made progress on integrating that, that UI. What we have done is some of the preliminary work that we identified to get metrics in place so that we can actually measure how well that works. And I'm going to show you some of those in a moment. Uh, but what you're about to look at is monitor.bisc network. And I have a feeling that a lot of people watching this um, video, may, maybe you've heard of it, but you haven't like actually really dug into it. And it's really, there's a lot of cool stuff there now. So I wanted to just take a little, little digression and give a very quick tour, right? Dashboard uh, at monitor.bisc network, just telling you how's trading going, high level numbers. Okay, we did about six Bitcoin in the last 24 hours worth of trading, et cetera. How many sell offers, buy offers. But if you scroll down there, mm -hmm. you'll see one of the one of the you know detailed uh, kind of dashboards is key performance indicators, and that's some stuff that we've built out over over the last um, you know months since that last call to support that change when onboarding does get integrated. So you already saw the estimated network size. Okay, how many nodes are on the network? But we've also got information about okay, how many offers are there relative to how many nodes are offers per node. So you can see that number right now is 0 0.7. So that means of course there are some nodes out there that don't have any published offers. Of course there are, right? Uh, but it's approaching one, right? That's kind of a good number. Okay, so most people who have a BISC node out there have one offer or maybe, maybe it's more lumpy, right? Some BISC nodes have lots of offers. Can't tell from that number, but that's one important data point. And then there's trades per offer, right? So how often are people actually finishing the process? Like, so it doesn't matter if somebody just publishes an offer if nobody ever takes it. But how many people are actually taking those offers? Which, you know, can be interpreted in different ways. Like how confident are people to actually click that button, right? And go through the process of the trade. So the more, the more successfully we onboard people, getting them from zero to ready to go, ready to trade, understanding what's necessary to do, we would probably see trades per offer go up, right? That would be a good thing. Um, you know, I guess ideally you want that number to be, you know, one-to-one, -one, but we'll never get there, right? But we can improve it and the onboarding process getting integrated should do that. So now we have baseline numbers. Right, that we can actually compare against. And those numbers are just interesting to look at on their own. So there's more that I'm not showing here, but it's really worth a, a look through there if you're interested in this kind of thing. Okay, and then the final goal that we identified in, Q, in Q1 was improving management. So what's the progress there like? Again, we had a lot of activity. Um, so we rolled out the new team structure that I think everybody's familiar with, right? Admin team, dev team, ops team, support team, etc. 
and we established the growth team and we established budgeting uh, across all of those teams and the total rolled up budget. Uh, we started really putting that budgeting into practice, both at the level of, you know, when, through the project management process, people are putting up estimates for their projects. This is about what I think it's going to take, right? Kind of denominated in, in US dollars. This is the, you know, sort of level, the estimate. Uh, and then team leads are taking that into account, right? When they're helping to approve those, those projects and so on, granting them budget, making sure that they don't go over budget. And, uh, and we're also keeping the budget in mind now when it comes to compensation, team leads are responsible for reviewing uh, compensation requests from members of their team or people who have done work sort of organized under that team. And uh, you can see, you know, again, not necessarily a perfect causation story here, but it's interesting to see what BSQ issuances looked like over the last, here we see the last eight cycles. This moment here in cycle eight was a, was a big wake up call. We had, um, you know, most people agree just too much issuance in that, um, in that cycle. And on review, you know, yeah, we said, oh, wow, that was really too much. We need, we need some more rigor here. So we started getting serious about it, thinking about how to do it. Already the number dropped down very significantly in cycle nine. And in cycle 10, we instituted uh, the, the compensation request review process right under the new budget. And so, you know, we see these kind of, this kind of trend line like you'd want. I mean, of course, we don't want that to go too low. We want people to do good work and get paid, right? But with this kind of, you know, extra level of, you know, judiciousness about are we, are we paying out the right kind of amount for the right kind of work and so on. So it's all about keeping, you know, BSQ inflation under control and being really um, prudent and appropriate with how we manage supply. Um, we also uh, established the project management process. We'll talk about that in a minute. And we generally cleaned up roles and bonding. So if you rewind four, five, six months, there were quite a few roles that people were playing, but they hadn't put up bonds for, myself included. <laughs> and, um, and just over the last months, it just step by step, roll by roll, um, you know, have gotten, just tightened everything up, made sure that things are documented, made sure that people are actually playing the roles that they say they are, that bonds have been put up and so on, and things are in much better shape. Okay, and uh, here we're just seeing, again, a glance at the master projects board. This time we're filtering on things that have been labeled to improve management, right? So that goal, and you see the things that I talked about, like establishing the budgeting process that's still in progress, and the other things like cleaning up roles and bonding and so on, like I mentioned. Okay, so so much for a review of the goals that we laid out in Q1. Let's talk about uh, the security incident that happened this April. Um, probably most people on the call will recall, but just to recap the facts, right? So 35, 34, almost 35 Bitcoin worth at the time, uh, $236,000 was stolen from seven victims. And we were in touch with all those victims. We have direct lines with every one of them. Ultimately, this was caused by a failure to, to validate the payout address that's used. We call this the donation address, right? But it's really the payout address that's used when cases go to arbitration. It became possible for the, for the uh, attacker here to spoof that address, right? To change it to their own. And we were just failing to validate that on both sides of the peer-to-peer -peer, you know, transaction, right? Trade, fix that immediately, shipped it immediately, problem is solved, right? So that, that won't happen again. We also have done some additional validations, right? Um, patching up potentially other holes. Uh, and the repayment of those victims, so we agreed that we would repay, uh, that's going to begin in version 136. So we just shipped 135 and we're finishing up, uh, you know, review and testing of the pull request for the change that's actually going to programmatically, automatically pay out those victims uh, using the Bitcoin, using trading fees that are paid in Bitcoin. So trading fees paid in BSQ 
won't be paid to the victims, but we still have the substantial amounts of trading fees being paid in Bitcoin, and those will be distributed out in a smart way across those seven victims. Um, so stay tuned for that. And uh, the whole incident, right, of course, led us to, to look deeply at, okay, well, how did this happen? How do we avoid something like this happening again? How do we know that something else like this isn't lurking, right? All of those hard questions have led us to create a new, a new team, right? In addition to the teams that we already laid out and I already mentioned a moment ago, a security team. I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. Uh, just double check again, everybody that you're muted. I occasionally hear an artifact. So somebody seems to be having their mic on. Okay, so I wanna talk a bit about challenges, right? Still sort of in the mode of looking back at Q1 and Q2. Um, where are we right now? What are, what are some of the challenges? This is not comprehensive, right? There are other things that could be on this list, but particularly with a view toward what I wanna talk about going forward, I wanna mention these in particular. I already mentioned this problem of too many arbitration cases or too many refund agent cases. Uh, one thing that seems to be happening, right, is what, we've, what we call future trades, right, where, where people are essentially gaming the system, uh, taking an offer and then waiting to actually complete the offer to see what the price does. And if the price moves against their favor, they cancel, right? And now this should be a situation that gets appropriately penalized uh, from their security deposit. But the way things are working in practice after the V1.2 um, arbitration and mediation changes, that, that penalty isn't happening like it should, certainly not as often as it should. So people are kind of getting away with this. And it seems to be you know, essentially a misalignment of incentives or a, mis or a, or a failure of checks and balances that lead to too many of these, what we call future trades. Uh, so we, we definitely want to lock that down. There are other reasons that things go to arbitration as well, like, you know, uh, failed protocol messages, uh, you know, somebody made the payment, but they couldn't click the button uh, because of a technical failure, right? And they end up unnecessarily going into arbitration and so on. So there's a combination of bugs that lead, that lead to this and, uh, some essentially design problems, right? And we wanna, we wanna really attack those uh, and cut down the number of these cases. It's not that there is a huge number, but really almost any number is too many. We, we, when we designed the V1.2 changes, we knew that the, the assumption was we would have a very, very low number of arbitration cases, like one or two a month, say, right? And we're seeing more than that you know, more like on the order of, you know, at least 10 or in some cases more, right? So we're not dealing with hundreds or what have you. And it's certainly not very likely that as a, as a user, you'll run into this problem. It's still certainly the minority of cases, but it's at the same time way too many. And it uh, jams things up and that's much more of a burden on the person playing the refund agent role and so on. So we really want to crush this uh, problem and one way that we'll do it is we'll increase fiat security deposits in V136, and we'll make sure uh, that, they, that the penalty actually gets enforced, right? If somebody's engaging this kind of future trade gaming situation. Uh, so it'll be really painful, right? Uh, if you don't follow the rules of the protocol. And of course, you'll get your full security deposit back and so on when things are completed properly. But this is one of the things that, we, that we've identified as just sort of almost obviously necessary to do in order to curtail this behavior. The other thing uh, that we'll certainly do, there's a number of things we may do, but the second thing that we'll certainly do is just put much more prominent messaging into the app about what it means to violate the protocol and what you should expect. And we won't do this as a pop-up, right? Because you know this has quite a few pop-ups and it's all too easy to just click them away and say, don't show me that again. We'll have this really deeply integrated into the kind of workflow screen that you see when you've taken a trade. Step one, step two, step three, right? You know, uh, send the payments, et cetera, confirm the payment. Deeply integrated there. We'll have, uh, you know, information about what it means, you know, what the rules are, what it means to violate that, and that, you know, your security deposit is at risk, basically. Um, so uh, the upshot is 
that we should expect post 136 to start to see a, you know, a down tick in the number of those uh, arbitration cases happen. And the second um, challenge that I wanna talk about, and again, this is really relevant to some things that we plan to roll out now that we'll get to in a moment, is uh, just how we're, how we're managing ourselves as a dev team. Um, so I'm calling out, you know, resourcing and prioritization and productivity. It's just a simple fact that we have, you know, relatively few people, very few people that are, you know, sort of waking up every day thinking about this and working on it like, a, like it's their full-time job, right? That's, a, you know, on the order of th three or four people tops, right? Uh, we have a number of new, newer, right? Some have been around for months already. Newer developers, in many cases, are really promising, have been doing great work, maybe aren't as fully dedicated, but are, in some cases, wanting to be, can be, and the work that they do do is great. I want to do a much better job going forward of coordinating those resources and really working as a team. Um, right now, we're not making the kind of progress that we think we can. And so it's a kind of back to this, you know, improving, if you'd like to call it management, but it's just asking a question, what do we need to do to make the fullest use of the people that we have, right? Against some pretty sticky challenges, right? Like uh, with the code base itself, right? This is a complex application and no one of us really has breadth and depth, you know, understanding and mastery of all of it, right? So we really wanna build up that muscle inside the team of you know collective understanding in depth about how this works so that it's possible for you know when things come up right one of us a couple of us can really get in there and make changes uh very effectively right and have it take a minimum amount of time uh, these things are really challenging right and so we have some ideas about how to do it we'll talk about that in a moment project management process comes into it and some new uh, developer calls is uh, we hope going to be a key aspect. So, okay, that's Q1 and Q2 in a nutshell. I'm sure I've missed some things. Sorry if I missed anything of great importance to you, but I think that gives a kind of gist, right, of, uh, of uh, what we've been up to and what we've done, how we did with our goals, etc. And so now let's talk about this moment, right, and going forward into Q3. Uh, themes and maybe some updated goals. I think from you know all the conversations that we've been having over the last over the last days and weeks, um, here are some themes, not necessarily complete or comprehensive, but some things that have been have been you know really floating around in the team. Um, one is let, let's stay the course, right? You know, a number of those goals are still totally relevant, uh, increasing liquidity and and, and so on and and we absolutely want to implement that onboarding workflow. Yeah, let's keep those goals in front of us and do everything we can to, uh, to continue carrying them out. Redoubling our security efforts, hugely important. We spend a lot of time on this, like I mentioned, the new security team, et cetera. Um, and improving dev teamwork, focus and productivity, like I just mentioned. Uh, and growing the user base. So I mentioned before, like, you know, we did this big liquidity push in March where a lot of the focus was around um, you know, market making, right? And incentivizing market making and rallying market makers, which makes a lot of sense, right? If you put, get a whole lot of offers, um, you know, across, you know, different key markets and different offer sizes and so on, like that makes BISC a much more attractive place for new users to show up and just be able to like click the button, right? Take an offer. Um, so it's a strategy that makes sense. And, uh, you know, just talking with, uh, Steve, right, the lead of the, the growth team, like one of his takeaways is, you know, it's not that that doesn't work and it's not that those efforts aren't worth investing something into, but that what seems to be even more effective, right, uh, certainly for like the, the effort involved and so on, is delivering more content more often, right? So you'll see in a moment some of that content work that's been done, but, you know, there's a, there's a, seems to be a pretty good relationship between you know, what we put out there for people on Twitter, particularly, right? You know, new content, new how-tos, things are going to be in the wiki, videos, getting started, guys, like we'll see in a moment. That seems to have a pretty good kind of return on investment 
And indeed, we do see more, more users, more trading on the platform. Now, exactly what is that because of, right? It probably has something to do with the market making efforts and it seems to just as a kind of, you know, big takeaway from these months of just being in the trenches doing this. Seems like it's about at least as much, if not more, delivering great content to people and really getting the word out and providing people with ever sort of easier uh, resources uh, to get going with this and understand this and so on. So that's a theme. So I just want to take a moment to try to update the goals. These are the five that we already talked about, and I think they largely stay the same, but I would probably scratch out improving support now, not because it's not ongoingly important. Support is, of course, very important, right? But rather just to indicate that it's largely working. So it's not something that needs to be necessarily a top line goal for us to continue improving it in radical ways, right? You need to keep doing what's working, keep making incremental improvements as we identify those things, of course. But I would put in its place security, right? Improving security. Like I said, redoubling our efforts there. Okay, so a few announcements. What's going on right now? Talked about the BISC Wiki. Many people, maybe most of the people on this call, have seen it in some way or even contributed to it, but we're really ready to have it be prime time and be more public about it and link to it more prominently and so on. So this is the, I think, as of today, even just a few hours ago, an updated main page, right? That's really kind of a nice, um, you know, central point that you can go and find out all the top level resources and so on. A bit of a different flavor, right, than the than the main website, this.network. Of course, that remains. That has its own utility and so on. But for the kind of, you know, people who are more familiar with this, maybe just need to get in there and like get access to all the different things, right? This is a, you know, a nice kind of dashboard main page to do that. And you'll see this getting started link there that I'll dig into in a moment. That's something new as well. So like I mentioned, it serves as a kind of support base or, or as a kind of knowledge base for support. There's lots of documentation pertaining to the DAO in there, particularly like role specifications. So that's where the documents live. Let's say, okay, you're playing a role like a GitHub admin or, or a mediator or a support team lead or whatever it is that we have, you know, I think 40 or so active roles in the DAO how all the responsibilities get taken care of. So what do those roles mean? What are their duties? What are their rights, et cetera? Like all of that stuff is in the wiki now. And uh, we've turned off account creation. When we opened it up, we had, um, you know, just anybody could create an account. Uh, it's sort of the wiki spirit, right? But unfortunately we had some, a uh, couple of like vandalization issues and so on. So we, we turned it off. Uh, but if you're interested in contributing, just come talk to us in Keybase. There's a wiki channel and um, you know, happy to grant access to people who want to add value to that. And who knows, maybe when we have more maturity around it, we'll open it up. What, what we're missing right now is like the team, you know, the, the individual or the team of people like, like think about like Wikipedia editors, right? We don't really have people standing by that like make it their business every day to, to review and to troll new pages and changes we do have people watching that but they have other responsibilities right so like the vandalization van vandalism you know just it happened and you know i mean we res responded pretty quickly but there's also just just really staying on top of even other contributors making changes to the wiki and making sure that they're like uh, the right changes there's actually like really sensitive information in there information that really matters um so you know we want to be careful to some degree we at least want to have some systematic review process and we don't know that right now so if this is something if you're watching this and you're like really into this sort of thing you know like um you know you love working with wikis you're you know great with documentation this is your profession that kind of thing like we want to hear from you because this is a sort of open role uh, you know playing that role of uh, editor reviewer patroller etc um Mostly, you just want to get in there and add valuable content. But if you are also inclined to do that kind of work, like we definitely like to talk to you. Okay, so on that 
getting started front. Uh, this is something pretty exciting, I think. Um, the getting started page on the main site has been uh, completely redone. And you'll see here that there's just four steps, right? Download and install, back up your keys, write down your seed, create a payment account, do a trade. And you'll notice there's like very little text. So it's light on text and it's heavy focus on walkthrough videos. Uh, and again, if you look at that, you'll see, you know, each one of these has several different, uh, you know, variants, right? Depending on what it is that you're interested in. Are you looking at a fiat trade or altcoin? Uh, are you on Windows or are you on Linux, right? So there's really a carefully designed, um, you know, I think a lot of effort went into this. And it's not easy to do a comprehensive and easily digestible getting started guide for BISC. You know, we've had walls of text in the past. We've been incrementally getting better and better and better at this. And this is now the, you know, the current apex of um, how we want to introduce people to it. So check it out. You'll notice that that resource on the main site links into the wiki in a number of places. Uh, please share it, right? You can tweet about this, whatever. Uh, okay, and so project management, which I've already mentioned a number of times. Uh, I just want to reiterate, why does this exist, right? So we want to have mechanisms in place, structures in place that help us make sure, ensure that we're working on what's most important, that we actually finish what we start, that we stay within the budgets that we've established or adjust them as necessary, and that we're not spreading ourselves too thin. That's really key, that we don't do too many things at once, thereby not doing things with enough quality or not finishing things or what have you. So project management, uh, kind of infrastructure that's in place is part of that, uh, part of ensuring that. Uh, there's the master projects board, which you've seen. Now you're seeing it without any filters on it. Um, you can see all those goals, right? You can see there's actually an improve security goal. So I just added that today. I closed the improve support goal and replaced it with this one. And, uh, you know, what are the different projects that are currently in flight? Like rolling out the disk wiki, we're just wrapping that up right now. What have we done? What's kind of in the backlog? You know, here's some new, newer projects that haven't yet, yet been triaged just to make sure that they're actually projects that make sense or well-formed or what have you. So there's a whole process there. And uh, that process is documented in the wiki, right? Uh, so if you haven't checked that out and this is something that might pertain to you, you know, uh, give it a look. This is certainly part of how, what we do in this can be influenced, right? And then um, another big piece of this, I think, is going to be the upcoming dev calls, which we'll get to in just a moment. So this is a, an in-flight uh, effort, right? A proposal has just been created for it. Um, so nothing is totally concrete yet, but I just wanted to give a in-the-moment kind of update here because I think this is pretty exciting and really um, pretty necessary that we do it um, in, in order to kind of achieve what our our highest you know, kind of capabilities as a team. I think we actually need to do calls like this. We've done them in the past, and we've done them in different ways in the past. And so one thing about this dev call uh, as something different, right? And uh, probably do a weekly cadence. Again, still thinking about that, but we might start with a weekly cadence. So imagine a weekly one hour call. Everybody's welcome, anybody can join. But certainly the people who would join on a regular basis are the people who are actively working in a development capacity with BISC, right? So team lead, you know, Christoph would be there. And everybody who's, you know, got an active task or active project or is somebody who just wakes up every day and works on BISC would attend that call, right? Um, and the goal, Again, I don't want to say anything too concrete, right? Because we're still working it out and you can help work this out by attending the first calls. But I think what we want to do, what we need to do is get really good at prioritization, right? There's just a finite number of people who can work on stuff and there's an infinite number of things that can be worked on. And we have to start getting really serious about identifying as a team, right? Like actually agreeing in a kind of rough consensus way. It doesn't have to be perfect agreement all the time, but, but having a shared mental model of what are the most important things in the BISC project. So a really easy example here is repaying the victims of the security incident, 
like everybody would agree or pretty much everybody would agree has agreed that's really important we need to do that right we need to execute that so that's like going to be right at the top of the list or near it and then there's everything that comes next and there's going to be you know some discussions to be had and so on about what that priority order should be but when we have that then it's about taking ownership of it right assigning people to those issues recruiting the participation of people who are going to help with those issues right so maybe you know developer x is going to own this task but they're going to need help in reviewing it right they're going to need help testing it they're going to maybe need help just having a pair to program with it right and go back and forth on exactly how to implement it how to design it etc so i think these calls and you know some work will get done offline but the work to be done on those calls is like actually committing to things. So prioritizing, committing to work, and really getting that kind of thumbs up from other people like, hey, I'll help you review that. Like, I'll make a commitment to take the time to do that. You know, and it's gonna show up real quick as a problem if somebody commits to review 10 things because they nobody has that kind of time and they have their own work to do, right? So we want to create this kind of situation where People are committing, we're holding each other to account, right? Hey, you know, you said you would help me with this, please do, and this is getting stalled, whatever, I'm blocked because I don't have any reviewers and people said they would, you know? Like that kind of thing, where we can really start moving forward because all too often things get held up in review, there's just too much going on, the review that we do is only cursory because we're too busy, right? All these things are the default state, like just chaos is the default state, so we have to work really hard to reverse the entropy of things here, right? And add order to the system. And I think these calls can be a super important part of that. And ultimately, I mean, you know, exactly what the techniques are and exactly what the agendas are and so on, like the outcome should be a growing sense of real teamwork. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the thrust, right? Is how can we work much better together as a team? When new people come on board, right? When like promising new developers show up and they say, hey, how can I help? I think we want to get into a situation where we can say, hey, join the call, right? It's just a few days away. We do it once a week. Take a look at what's going on. You'll see what's going on that's most important, and you'll hear from people who need help. Say you'll help. Help test. Help, help you know, write tests. Help do manual testing. Help, uh, you know, implement whatever. Whatever needs to be done, as opposed to the kind of default state that we're in now, which is like, well, you can go check out the good first issues. You, know, you can go scratch a little itch over here. here. Here's a small project that might work. It's not that there's not room for that stuff. Of course there is. But the default state, you know, we're asserting here is maybe better that we really take people into the fold right away and say, this is the most important stuff. And in doing that, we help chip away at this kind of shared knowledge problem that we have. Like people start to really understand BISC in depth because they're working on the most important, which are often the most sticky, most difficult issues. And if that's where they're starting, well, that's a powerful start, right? They're not just making a cosmetic change or what have you. Again, there can be room for that, but we have to design it in. The developers really get deeply integrated and onboarded in a way that makes a difference and really matters and helps them feel included and helps them feel valuable, right? Because they actually really help land valuable deliverables. So that's kind of the whole thrust, right? And exactly how we do that again is a work in progress, but you can you can help craft that, right? Just by attending the calls and giving feedback and so on. So stay tuned. The proposal is out there, and um, you know, yeah, I think that's really exciting. Uh, like like has been mentioned a few times, we have a new security team. So it's just, it's about taking BISC's, you know, security has always been important to BISC, right? From day one, we wouldn't be where we are today if we didn't, if we weren't security minded, uh, just like if we weren't privacy minded, this would have failed miserably a long time ago. But clearly we have to take it to another level, right? We cannot let things like happen in April ever happen again we have to we have to at least be able to look ourselves in the mirror and say we did everything that we possibly could do new to do uh you know to prevent that right so what does that next new level look like well that's what's being spec'd out and rolled out uh as we speak under the auspices of this new team right so florian is the lead there and uh you know if you have ideas questions about this etc you can talk to him of course you can bring it up anywhere in keybase but um you know 
stay tuned for that because that'll be an important part of what's getting prioritized and so on and so forth. Okay, and just a couple of things I wanted to mention, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention. Um, if you're a contributor and you're issuing a compensation request, today is actually the deadline for cycle 14. So you probably already noticed there's a new compensation request format that uh, allows us to programmatically parse and tally up, you know, how much people are asking for and according to which team. And this is all in service of helping us actually manage this budget. Um, so it's pretty cool. Uh, if you haven't done it yet, try it out. The issue template is there. You do it by default. And it's just a tabular format. So you're using kind of markdown tables instead of a free form prose to request your compensation. Um, of course, this will be a trial run in cycle 14 and in cycle 15, if it's going well enough, we'll say, okay, it's mandatory. Everybody needs to do it this way and um, should really help streamline things. Uh, an update on SegWit support in BISC, right? The, the long most wanted uh, feature by many. Uh, we've We've done an analysis, right? Uh, uh, Oscar Winsberg came uh, back into the project and did a, an analysis and a kind of write-up and a plan for how we can implement SegWit support in a way that makes sense. So that's out there. There is not a clear, uh, you know, assignment of who's going to do that and when and priority and so on. But this will be one of the things we want to talk about on the dev calls and we'll identify people to do that and so on and so forth. But it's just worth mentioning that we've been making some progress forward on SegWit. And I wanted to mention Bitcoin 2020. Maybe a lot of people know that that was going to happen. It's been canceled. Uh, we plan to have a big presence there this year. And of course, that all didn't happen because of COVID stuff. Um, there are still, so while I think details aren't fully known and certainly aren't fully public, conversations are going on about how, you know, Bitcoin 2020 or whatever its equivalent is going to happen, when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen, and so on. And we're certainly involved in those uh, conversations, and we certainly plan to have a presence um, at whatever that is, whenever it happens. Uh, just FYI, because that was going to be a, a big splash for us this year. So we're still looking forward to it. And uh, the final thing in uh, the talk tonight is an update on my status. Uh, I, this actually is my last day and my last act with the project, uh, I'm going to step away from BISC. And uh, the reason for that, I think, as maybe many know that are on this call, um, I just had a heck of a last couple of years uh, with my health. And um, while I'm happily, I'm doing pretty well now, my journey there is not at all finished. And um, while I had hoped when I came back to the project after being away because of those health issues, I came back in like November or so of last year, it's been about six months. My hope was, okay, you know, I can kind of balance this out in some way and, and do what I love to do here and manage all the other uh, new things that I need to manage in my kind of new life uh, after my health issues. And that just hasn't been working. And what I really need to do in the final analysis is intensely focus on uh, my health and my mobility and my family um, for some time to come, for the foreseeable future anyway. Um, and I'm excited about that. It's really the right call for me. And, but it's also like um, kind of surreal to say that it's, you know, just looking back, I mean, April, I think of 2014 or something like that, or sometime in 2014, you know, I got involved with this when it was, you know, basically brand new. And one way or another, I've been involved um, since. And uh, so it's strange to say goodbye and a little, a little unreal, a little surreal, um, but that's what's happening. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so of course I've spent the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, I announced that sort of internally, couple of weeks ago and I spent that time just checking boxes and trying to hand things off. Um, for example, one of the things that I was responsible for was the API work and the BISC daemon. I'm glad to say that I've handed that off to, uh, to G Hub Stan, right? Uh, maybe you know his handle. And he's been working with Demos and that process and that project and so on, that'll, that'll evolve, right? And that becomes, that becomes theirs now. Um, so uh, but keep an eye, provide feedback, try things out, right? Um, you know, like we started to be a little public about this in last week with tweets and so on. I want to start getting users involved when it makes sense. Um, that, that I think is just some of the most exciting, most important work. And it's really 
beyond the opportunity of that work for um, you know increasing liquidity and just you know potentially dramatically growing user base and all of that stuff it's also really a moment for us to um, get right a number of things that we know we've been needing to get right you know like every endpoint that we implement in that API if you think about it in a kind of adversarial way right um, you know just thinking with your attacker hat on every every endpoint we open up if there's a bug if there's an exploit if there's a security issue behind that functionality within that functionality we are now opening up programmatic access to it right so there's a there's a level of diligence and rigor that we want to bring to this project uh, that's both just demanded in order to do it well but is also now in many ways for the first time possible to do well right well, what's been missing for so long in disk is the ability to do automated end-to-end -end integration testing why because BISC was built as a desktop UI, right? So everything you do, in so many cases, you do manually. You click buttons. Well, that doesn't work for automated end-to-end -end integration testing. But every endpoint we light up gets us closer to being able to do that in an automated way, right? So we can really build the kind of tests and testing infrastructure that BISC has always needed and just up the level, right? So, you know, more power to everybody there. I'm super excited. I'll be watching that one and um go team so uh the admin team uh so of the teams admin ops dev growth etc support security uh we'll decommission the admin team for now my role as admin team lead which is really kind of like an alias for you know project lead for bisc and so on that that role that i've been playing uh it's not obvious that 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 role should be taken over at all right you know we did that especially in q1 to kind of really bootstrap all these organizational changes and you know have a sort of position that could just call some shots and say let's try this let's do that let's do that much of that work has been done uh certainly not all of it it would maybe be nice to have that role going forward in some ways but it's also a risk right that kind of you know um cent centralization or you know sort of re real hierarchy right and you know top dog or ceo kind of role that's ultimately antithetical to what BISC, the BISC DAO wants and needs to be, right? So it's also maybe a good time to decommission that and say, okay, now it's about the, you know, more distributed set of team leads to carry some of those things forward, take some shared responsibility for it, increasingly pushing down that responsibility to, you know, every contributor, making sure that, you know, people are handling roles well and so on, and see if we can get that stuff done without an admin team lead. As, as we had. So that's the status of that. Um, anybody who is under the admin team, like just for example, compensation maintainer, uh, roles maintainer, et cetera, they'll have their compensation requests reviewed by other, by other team leads or in peer review. So I was doing those reviews, but that won't happen anymore, just as a side note detail. Um, the roles that I play, I have about six different roles, um, you know, including the admin team, so that one will go away, but, um, or team lead. Um, certain of those roles I'll continue to play. I've bonded into them. They don't have an obvious um, uh, replacement. Um, so I'll, I'll carry things like uh, owning our domain name or, or D DNS admin, things like that. They're basically totally passive roles, very, very infrequently uh, needed um, you know, for action to be taken. So I'll, I'll continue those. I'll hand them off more slowly. Somebody else will bond into them, but there's sort of no rush. So while it's my last day of uh, general availability and you know you, you won't see me around uh, keybase actively and, and github actively and so on i'll still have a couple of threads going on at least for a little while um yeah thanks thanks for you know really years of something that's just been a total labor of love for me yeah thanks um q a i think we're over we're five minutes over, but if anybody has, um, you know, questions or comments or whatever, please um, open up your mic and go for it. Thank you for your leadership in this, Chris. Mm. Yeah. Also, thanks from my side. It's uh, yeah, it was very essential uh, for this critical time, and yeah, you you contributed so much to this. Yeah, 
it will never be forgotten. And yeah, even if it's now for a longer time that you won't be here uh, with us, uh, yeah, that's never say never. <laughs> Maybe we can welcome you back to the BISC family at some point. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Yeah, Chris, I've learned a ton from you. So I want to say, I want to thank you for that and uh, wish you all the best with uh, your health, your family, and everything you uh, choose to do now. Thanks, man. Thank you. Chris, I have a lot to thank you for. You know a lot about that. And I wish you the best of luck in everything. Cheers, Stan. Yeah, good luck to you too. Yep, I also wish you the best, and uh, yeah. Thanks, Andy. Okay, guys. Yeah, cheers. See you around the Bitcoin world. Bye-bye. <laughs>